Okay, today we are very happy to have uh, Harry Ramani from Berkeley. I think uh, he will move to Stanford for second postdoc in the fall. And uh, today he will tell us about the pulsar timing probe of the small scale structure. Okay, you can start now. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the invite. It's just a pleasure to, to always speak to uh, people at Davis. And then I've been lucky to be uh, uh, close enough that, that we have met a couple of years, a couple of times a year. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm moving to uh, Stanford from, from Berkeley and uh, this, this is stuff done at Berkeley uh, with Jeff Dror, uh, Tanner, a grad student, and Catherine Zurek, who's now at Caltech. Uh, and this is work uh, titled Puzzle Timing Probes of Small Scale Structure. A uh, couple of papers, one from uh, last year and one and one from early this year, uh, actually a month month early, uh, month ago actually. Uh, I would like to start off by by thanking people in the front lines and and, and acknowledging that these are some pretty pretty uh, dire times and and, and 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 I hope that things things improve in this uh, in this country, which I now call home. Uh, so here's here's the outline. Uh, I would first talk about dark matter stop structure, why I think we should study it, and, and the particle physics implications. Uh, I'll talk about millisecond pulsars as a, as a tool I have, uh, uh, we have um, recognized as, as something that's very adept at studying substructure. <clears throat> I'll talk about some specific specifics, deterministic and stochastic probes of, of first primordial black holes, and then I'll add some dressing, uh, improve it to probes on more diffuse objects, which we call diffuse halos. And then uh, even further, I'll, I'll add some halo mass functions, which is these objects will not be at a, sitting at a single mass anymore, and they, will, they, will, uh, uh, they could exist at any mass and, and further provide an outlook. So how is so this talk is not about the next five years or the next 10 years, but rather what could be a nightmare scenario come 2050. You do not see any uh, uh, non-gravitational uh, proofs for dark matter. Your favorite dark matter, it has some direct detection or indirect detection uh, uh, signals, except you do not see it. And, and, and what do we do then? That's, that in some sense is the ball, is, 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 is what I'm uh, setting as the goal here. So I hope you'll excuse me for being super optimistic about things and, and looking, at, uh, looking at times 20 to 30 years from now where the world will look very, very different. Um, so, so to start with, what do we know about dark matter today? There's ample gravitational evidence and there's only gravitational evidence. Uh, there is no confirmed positive signal uh, as yet in the Lampos paradigm. There's a bevy of uh, promising experiments to probe interactions uh, with, with uh, standard model. Um, and, and there are several more on the ANVIL. Uh, excuse me one second. Uh, okay. Um, on the ANVIL. Uh, I want to ask what about gravitational probes? After all, all of this is in the Lampos paradigm. While there are reasons to look under the Lampos, I think we should start uh, slowly getting out of it and, and, and looking at possibly gravitational probes. At this point, you could get a little snooty with me and tell me, hey, but uh, sure, there's some structure out there. What more do I learn from dark matter? Come back to me only if you learn about the underlying particle physics, for which I have this rebuttal. We already know a lot about dark matter, except for the fact that it, it, uh, if we know a lot more than that. It just it, it interacts with us uh, gravitationally. Uh, take, for example, the bullet cluster. We know, we know a little bit about, about the self-interactions, that they cannot be too large. Or the dwarf galaxies, your, your mass cannot be, you know, less than 10 to the minus 21 EV from, from looking at dwarf galaxies. Or take super radiance or, or other cool gravitational probes of fuzzy dark matter, which can rule out entire uh, um, um, uh, uh, mass regions of parameter space without, without worrying about the coupling at all. There are clues from small scale structure, like things like the Cori cusp. And if you take it super seriously, uh, it, it could even tell you what kind of interactions dark matter could have in order to, in order to ameliorate the Cori cusp problem. There are recent hints of subhalos from gaps in cellar streams, which could uh, then we would know structures which are smaller than dwarf galaxies on the whole, um, uh, the, the lightest the mass, dark matter mass can be gets even pushed up even further. Um, and I want to ask the question, how about substru substructure at even smaller scale, specifically intragalactic scale, which has not been studied very well till now. Um, so let's, let's uh, go back to just plain vanilla CDM and ask, oh, what, a, what kind of substructure we 
would see there. Vanilla CDM predicts diffuse structure concentrated at larger masses. In fact, the WIMP paradigm predicts masses, uh, 10 to the minus six solar masses and above. It says that there is, there is a there is a turnaround at around 10 to the minus six solar masses. And this corresponds to kinetic de decoupling at a few MeV, while there is, there, is, uh, uh, the, the, uh, there is chemical decoupling earlier, kinetic de decoupling for, for, for WIMPY uh, cross sections happens, uh, happens uh, much later. And this leads to washout of, of uh, smaller scale, scale structure. Uh, so we, one would naively conclude that there shouldn't be any structure below 10 to the minus six, except you've already required more than just CDM. You're requiring there is some non-trivial interactions with the standard model. So if you remove that, then there will be structure on all scales. In fact, there are other non-trivial models that can predict drastically different halo mass functions. So in CDM, you would, you would predict approximately this, this, uh, this line to, to go all the way down, whereas there are some non-trivial models where, where a structure would lie entirely in the smaller mass range, as, 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 as I will show in a second. So one example of this is... Can I, sorry, uh, can I ask, can you, can you explain just, uh, I mean, uh, say just a little bit more, what, what exactly is the halo mass function? Uh, sorry. So the halo mass function is so so you go and count uh, independent gravitationally bound structures. So we can naively think in the case of baryons, you have Earths, you have uh, uh, stars, you, you have planets, you have comets, things like that. So it's so in in the y-axis here, you plotted the, the, this halo mass function is plotted as d n d log m. It's just addressing what is the number density of objects at a particular mass m. That, that 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 is the halo mass function so wh what what defines i mean an object sorry i mean you've got some distribution of dark matter it's over dense here it's under dense here right you're but this is somehow counting a discrete number of objects indeed so cdm so this is after structure is formed after stars have formed it's all today yes it's all today so dark matter uh, collapse starts uh, just after matter radiation equality. So, so then it's, we shouldn't think of it as just diffuse structures, but we should think of like, uh, you know, galaxy clusters, galaxies, satellite galaxies. And inside the galaxy, the question is, is it, you know, a smooth paste, which means that this halo mass function even doesn't make any sense, or is there substructure inside the galaxy? Is it not a smooth paste? Instead, it's, it's in some sense sequestered into these small halos what we call subhalos, if you want. So, so the idea is that this is a late time observable that is supposed to somehow measure the amount, like if there are a lot of over dense regions of dark matter, you would mm -hmm. expect there to be more substructure on that scale. So this is correlated with having a higher density contrast at some mm -hmm. short Precisely. scale. That's the Precisely. idea? Precisely. Right, okay, thanks. Precisely. So, so that's, that's exactly the next slide. There are a few models. And then as Marcus already alluded to, if there is power, this is matter power at, at very large K, which is, which is the co-moving wave number, then that naively corresponds to, to, black, uh, to, to uh, models of dark matter, which will have higher substructure, higher clumpiness at, at smaller scales. So examples among these are, are, are this inflationary vector model that, that Peter Graham and, and Sujit uh, wrote down. There are models of, of uh, black holes where people consider these, these uh, phase transitions that are tuned to produce PBHs at very, very small uh, mass intervals, just so they can hide it in, in gaps in the, in the lensing program. Uh, there are things like early matter domination. So before radiation domination, which is, which is very uh, bad for structure formation, if you had early matter domination, that could form compact structure that then does not get uh, uh, broken down by subsequent radiation domination. And this, this could be, again, something that we see today. And, and finally, probably the most concrete, there is there's this whole uh, industry going on right now where they're looking at Pejequin phase transitions after inflation. Uh, which again seed uh, high power. And, and there are even some very tall claims that there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the axion mass, so which is plotted uh, uh, in, in the right, uh, to, to the halo mass function today. Like in, in what mass halos, uh, in, in what interval of masses would you actually observe these axion mini clusters?
right? So these are this is a very nascent field. So the jury is still out on how well you can do things like this. But there seems to be hope that there are deviations from CDM, which are probably worth looking at, which we will understand, which, which will help us understand even, even the particle nature of what kind of dark matter this could be. So my, my point in some sense in this talk is we have always, uh, I think there is, there is a mainstream opinion that, that dark matter could span this whole region of mass space all the way from 10 to the minus 20 EV to, to uh, a, a few PV and above for, for, for elementary masses, or it could form PVHs in, in a few uh, solar mass range uh, where you do microlensing. But the point could be that we could fail to look at a single uh, uh, dark matter uh, in, in the particle uh, picture. You, they could just be too feebly interacting with a standard model such that they escape this detection. However, we could let, get lucky with cosmology that the, it forms these uh, structures and you could use a lot of the things we use to hunt for PBHs to look for slightly more diffuse objects, albeit they still, they still, uh, uh, um, they still allow uh, micro lensing or some other lensing to, to, uh, to, to tease these things out. Okay. There are of course several unknowns. I, will, I don't wanna claim that, that I, can, I can immediately tell you what the particle physics is from, from looking at these halos. After all, given an initial power spectrum, what is the substructure today? That's a very well posed, but very hard to solve problem accurately. This is because even if you're very good at you know, doing the n-body simulations or, or, or some kind of uh, approximate fitting to get, get this kind of substructures you would get, there is subsequent, uh, subsequent, uh, halo, there is a subsequent host halo that forms, in our case, the Milky Way halo, which could tidally strip these, strip these ar objects orbiting around, around, this, around this gravitational potential. Right. Or there could be mergers which, which make these objects bigger. These are, these are opposing forces in some sense. And, and the question is, how much of the dark matter still survives in these subhalos which you can look, get, then look for? Or is the answer that the subhalos get entirely stripped such that inside the Milky Way halo, there is no point in looking for subhalos. It's just some one diffuse, uh, diffuse space that's just, that's just uh, sloshing about. I will take an agnostic word towards the issue, but there is ample evidence to suggest that uh, higher concentration subhalos can survive till today. So this is not an entirely, you know, uh, foolhardy task to go behind. And I'll project constraints agnostically. But I would like to also point out that the answers to this question are important for direct detection. After all, if all of structure was nicely packaged into these subhalos, then it, it is possible to to dream up scenarios where these subhalos uh, drastically change the sampling rate on Earth for something like direct detection, right? So, so all kinds of things will change now because you, you, have, you have drastically changed how dark matter is distributed. So you might even have to revisit the null results on direct detection and, and in, interpret them as them just being too clumpy and hence not arriving on Earth, uh, you know, um, with, within a year or few years time scale where all experiments have run. So, so I'll, I'll just present some, some uh, probes of, of uh, different scale structure. So on the larger scales, you have, you have things like H0. And as you go lower and lower, uh, you might have heard of several, several talks on, on, on different scales and, and, and how, well we know, how well we know the matter power spectrum on, on all these scales. And, and this paper points out that the final point frontier is 100 solar masses and below. And this is because as you go to lower and lower solar mass halos, at some point the mass is small enough such that it's, it's not conducive to stellar formation. So these are entirely dark objects, which you have to see entirely from the dark, dark matter properties, gravitational properties, rather than the properties of, 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 of uh, stars living in where you can do all kinds of uh, fancy uh, spectroscopy. With. Right, and the point of this talk, of course, is that pulsar timing six here, and 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 that will be that will be the that will be the rest of rest of this talk. So, what are these what are these pulsars specifically? Millisecond pulsars. These are neutron stars that are sped up through accretion. So they have they have a companion that they uh, that they uh, 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 sap mass out of, and also angular moment out momentum out of, and, and and hence they get sped up. The fastest rotating pulsars have frequencies of a few kilohertz, and that's the reason, of course, why they 
They're called uh, millisecond pulsars. And they are stable over remarkable time scales. So, so we don't know how long they, they have been stable. For the 20 or so years that we have observed many of them, they, they are very, very stable, stable uh, uh, rotating objects. And, and furthermore, what's pretty fascinating is that accurate timing models exist. So, so what is this timing model? So let's take the phase of, 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 of these, of these uh, uh, rotations that are coming, uh, coming towards us. You could, you could do a Taylor expansion, of course, if that's allowed. And you have this phi naught plus nu t plus uh, nu dot t square and so on. Nu is kilohertz, of course, as I just mentioned in the previous slide. Nu dot over nu is actually a pretty small and it's around 10 to the minus 20 hertz. So this, this corresponds to pulsar spin down if you want. And new double dot over new is less than 10 to the minus 31 hertz square. And it's not been observed for most pulsars so much so that only the first two variables are used to fit this, uh, fit this timing model. After fitting away the period and the derivative, residuals are remarkably small. So TRMS, which is, which is the residu residual after fitting, goes to even as small as 50 nanoseconds today, and it's expected to improve as we, as we, uh, as we do better uh, radio physics with, with, with these objects, right? This is, this, is, uh, this is really cool in my opinion. Uh, imagine observing stuff for 20, uh, 20 years. These are uh, data is taken every week, and, and these, these have periods of, of, of a millisecond, as I just mentioned earlier. And except with, with these few parameters, uh, you, can, you can fit a whole, uh, a whole stream of data uh, for, 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 for a couple of decades. So what is the corollary of this? Any phenomenon that predicts time dependent delta phi can possibly be observed and constrained. Right? This was used in the Hulse-Taylor binary. Uh, and, and there was an indirect uh, detection of gravitational waves well before LIGO, uh, which I had not appreciated before, before studying pulsar timing arrays. So what they did was uh, the pulsar and neutron star system was slowly uh, uh, coming together, was, was coalescing. And, and the pulsar now, uh, because it was beaming radio pulsars, uh, this, this kind of analysis made a pulsar a very good accelerometer, the pulsar itself. And so its acceleration could be detected very accurately. And, and it's, it's the, the prediction for what the acceleration would be as the neutron star pulsar system got together was very well described by GR and then gravitational wave uh, radiation from, from, this, from these two objects. Um, and of course, in the modern sense, this can be used as an extremely low frequency gravitational wave detector. So you flip this on its head and now ask, can the Earth act as an accelerometer? You have a bunch of telescopes, which are now looking for different, uh, different pulsars beaming at us. And if the Earth were to suffer uh, accelerations, then you would see a, a correlated imprint on all these, all these neutron stars with the, with the appropriate uh, angular uh, uh, projection, if you want. And, and this can be used as a very accurate uh, accelerometer. So, so this is what gravitational wave collaborations are doing today. Uh, so these collaborations today, there are three, EPTA, Nanograv, and PPTA. And, and uh, they, uh, they, together they have looked for 73 pulsars. And uh, they, uh, the oldest pulsars are around 30 years, albeit they fun function a little poorly, uh, but, but there are very good ones uh, in, in the 50 nanosecond TRMS I showed a couple of slides ago, which are 20 years old. And these pulsars are anywhere between one to 10 kiloparsec away, away from Earth. In the future, uh, there are several precursors currently running uh, to look and uh, to locate these pulsars, which will then in the future be looked at with, with things like the square kilometer array. Anywhere from 200 to 1,000 pulsars are, are projected. Uh, you, can, you can take data. The, the only, uh, so this is not limited by how many pulsars, millisecond pulsars are thought to exist near Earth, but instead it's limited by how much data that you, you can take. This is, turns out to be a very expensive enterprise to, to, to collect this data. These are all projected to start around 2030, where a lot of things are up in the air, and, and, and these, these pulsar timing arrays are, are expected to run 20 plus years to, to, to uh, get the kind of sensitivity that, 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 that they can maximize. So for this talk, in order to be concrete and, and show you some limits, I'll assume an SKA of around 200 pulsars, 50 nanoseconds, two weeks, uh, time of 20 years, uh, and and uh, Z naught, which is the distance to to each pulsar uh, of approximately five kiloparsec. So just to uh, note, 
uh, except for NP equals 200, which is way more than the number of pulsars we are looking at today, the rest are already proven facts in that current collaborations already achieve these kind of sensitivity and data taking. So there is no kind of jump in something like that. But if you are to be a little more optimistic in that we can improve our sensitivities, we can improve data taking in the next 30 years, then we could possibly think of you know, NP equals 1,000, T equals 30 years, 10 more years, a decade more, uh, TRMSS of 10 nanosecond, which, 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 which pulsar timing collaborations think are feasible, cadences of a week, and double the distances. So a little more fainter pulsars, but nonetheless, uh, pulsars we have still already observed. So just to put things in perspective, I talked about how these are gravitational wave probes. So you, want, you might wonder, why haven't I heard of them before? That's because they are at much lower frequencies than, than what we are used to. So we have, I'm sure we've all listened to several talks on LIGO and LISA and things like that. So these typically sit in the 10 to the minus three hertz to you know, uh, kilohertz range, whereas uh, these, these pulsar timing arrays will not be that sensitive. There will be several orders of magnitude less sensitive in this higher frequency range. But in the lower frequency range, in the one over year range, uh, one over few years, that is 10 to the minus eight hertz range, you will, you will have very good sensitivity from, from, from uh, pulsar timing arrays. And, and they also have their own sources for, for why, why such a program would be interesting. And I encourage you to uh, read, read up if, if, if you're interested on, 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 on the kind of things that these, these uh, pulsar timing arrays are, are, are very good at seeing. Uh, the question I want to ask is, can these gravitational uh, uh, wave detectors be repurposed as, as subhalo uh, detectors, right? So what, what are some gravitational probes of, of subhalos? They come, come uh, roughly in two varieties. Okay. So first one probes the gravitational interaction between light and dark matter clumps. One example of this is lensing, of course, like PBHs, primordial, some, or, or even any other black holes. They, they bend light coming from a star. So you see a lensing event. That's how, that's how lensing works. Or you probe gravitational interaction of dark matter with some test mass, which is the Doppler effect. So, so a dark matter object passes by either your, your emitter or your receiver. That causes a tiny acceleration. We saw that in the Hulse-Tyler binary. Right? Very, very similar, except now caused by dark matter instead of the companion neutron star sitting next to it. And so this is, this is called the Doppler effect. And what I'll show is that PDAs have both these kind of signals. 1A, light, light interacting with, with, with dark matter clump, and B, dark matter interacting with either the pulsar or the Earth. Uh, here's some ex existing literature. This is no, no, by no means a, a brand new idea. People have explored this in various contexts in the past. Ultralight dark matter could cause gravitational wave like uh, delays. This is something we didn't explore in this work, uh, but I, I, I encourage you to read this paper by Rubakov and, 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 and uh, Sujit, Peter, and, and co uh, on, on, on uh, non gravitational interactions. The point of this talk is, is, is twofold. The first one is PTAs are sensitive to accelerometers, are, are sensitive accelerometers. So this is the Doppler delay. And gravitational potential wells caused by dark matter substructure along the light path uh, could lead to Shapiro delay, uh, which is similar to the Zach Wolf effect, if, if you want, where, where, where uh, a time dependent gravitational potential causes frequency jumps. Uh, so our work, we provide explicit calculations of SNR, which, which whereas earlier work were all pretty uh, hand wavy and, 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 and did dimensional analysis, if you want. We provide com comprehensive analysis of all signal, signal types, so, so very exhaustive work on every signal type possible. And we also extend our work to diffuse halos, whereas people were primarily interested in PBHs, we think that there is a more interesting uh, uh, extension to this, which is, which is more diffuse objects which are predicted by various different models, whereas primordial black holes are very hard to model build from, from, from very uh, general uh, considerations. So what types of signals? So there are, there are various ways in which I can divide the signals. So, 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 so uh, there is, there's a bunch of them which, which can get, get a little confusing. So I'll try my best to, to uh, explain it as well as I can. So, so in terms of the type of effect, as I've already alluded to, you can have the Doppler effect or the Shapiro effect. In terms of the length of signal, whether you see the whole signal or, or, or the signal duration is much longer than 20 years, you have a dynamic or a static signal. In terms of the number of signals accumulated, whether you're accumulating a single blip or many stochastic events, you have a single uh, deterministic signal or many stochastic signals. 
uh, <clears throat> whether the signal affects the earth, that is it shows up in all pulsars, or uh, it affects the individual pulsars, you can divide it into the earth term. This is true only for Doppler, of course, as I will explain, or the pulsar term where, where uh, both Doppler and Shapiro can show signals. So in general, uh, there could be eight plus four, 12 distinct signal types. Some will be subdominant. So I'll try to, try to uh, flush all that out in the, in, the, in, the, in the rest of my talk. So for simplicity, let me start with primordial, monochromatic primordial black holes, and then I'll add the bells and whistles on top of them. Let's just, we, we can try to understand where PTA sit in terms of what they can see purely from seeing monochromatic primordial black holes, right? So, so, uh, so the point is, you, for, for, for Doppler delay, you recognize that D nu over nu, which is the first, if you want the first derivative of, of, of the phase that we looked at a few slides ago, is, is, is the same as uh, the relative velocity over C, right? By, by which I mean there could be some intrinsic variations in, in uh, pulsars, but we know from the timing model that those things don't exist, which means that we have a very good handle on measuring D nu over nu, nu which is very stable which means that the relative velocity of the pulsar with respect to the earth is also a very stable object, which means that these are tiny uh, there are tiny accelerations which you are sensitive to. After all, the same philosophy was used in the Hulse-Taylor binary in order to track the pulsar and neutron star uh, coalescing. So what is the velocity shape for a point object transit, which, is, which I show here, the dark matter clump moving, what does that look like? It has two components. The first component is along the impact parameter that is permanent. The dark matter has, has permanently pulled the, pulled the pulsar towards it. Uh, so there's a permanent change in velocity that, that goes like B dot D if you want. And, 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 and uh, as you see, it goes from minus one to one. It, it leaves a permanent imprint. There is also a V dot D component. So that's, that's along the dark matter clump velocity, but that's temporary. So it goes up as, as, as the dark matter clump goes close enough, but as it's pulling away, it restores that velocity back into the pulsar. So you go back to zero in, 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 in asymptotic future, right? There are some parameters I'll use here, which I'll, which I'll try to explain now. So B is the impact parameter, B is the velocity. So I define a characteristic time tau given by B over B. So, so this is just, you know, uh, the typical rise time in the case of the blue curve and the typical rise plus lower time in the case of the red curve. So, so it's, it's, although the signal itself can last for much longer, uh, this I define as a characteristic time, okay? Um, so what does the geometry look like? So to, to determine typical time scale, uh, we can determine the objects of closest approach. So, so let me concentrate on the pulsar term for now. So I have NP pulsar say, and now I draw these circles around pulsars to ask uh, uh, how many different halos I catch in my net, right? And the net, net area, in some sense, keeps increasing as, as the number of pulsars keep increasing, which means that the closest an object gets to at least one, to, to one pulsar, to the best pulsar, is, is, goes as one over square root of NP, right? That's, that's, that's the point of this, of this formula. So tau min, the closest, the closest uh, time duration, uh, the smallest time duration of, 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 uh, of clumps scales as one over square root of NP. Furthermore, as you see, you already get out some details of where you will be sensitive to. What it says is that for a 20 year duration, if you wanna see the whole event within 20 years, which is the time scale of your, of your pulsar timing event, your mass better be not too much larger than, or even larger than 10 to the minus nine solar masses, because you just, you'll just have a sampling problem. The closest object, as you keep increasing masses, the number density decreases. So the, co the, the, the closest object is just farther away. Right, so, so that, that, that's the point of this. And, and, and of course you can keep increasing F, the fraction of dark matter in, in mass M. You can't increase it of course about one. Uh, so you're stuck, at, you're stuck at these masses. So based on this, you can divide signals into dynamic and static. If tau is much less than T or, or tau is less than T such that you can see the whole event, we call this a dynamic event. And if tau is greater than or equal to T, we call it a static event, okay. So uh, how do we look at dynamic signals? These are probably the better signals to look at because they're super robust. You see the whole signal, you can, you can you know, uh, uh, fit for it. So you could do a, something like a bump hunt, which we're all familiar with, or a LIGO kind of signal. It's a deterministic signal or a micro lensing signal. These are all, all sim in similar vein, by which I mean you can, you can fit for, for, for the entire signal shape. 
And furthermore, Doppler leaves a permanent imprint, which is, which is pretty cool. We will, we will exploit this. And Shapiro, as we will see in the next slide, is a blip, so, so it's a temporary signal. And SNR in either case is a solved problem in signal processing. You just ask what kind of power you had at, uh, have at scale F, and then you filter over, over the white noise, uh, which I call S uh, delta dot T here, and, and, and you integrate over all F to get your SNR. So you just do your signal uh, power over the noise power to get, you, to get your SNR. Okay. Um, so let me just talk about pulsar versus earth term. You have many more pulsars than one earth, which means that the impact parameter far lower for one lucky pulsar. Uh, however, you can exploit angular correlations on earth. The earth, uh, if it's an earth term, you'll have the exact same imprint across every pulsar, uh, of course, accounting for the angle that, that the pulsar subtends with, with, with uh, uh, B, the impact parameter of, of your, of your uh, uh, dark matter clump which means that sensitivity is far higher for the earth term. Uh, but it is possible that the pulsar term trumps in, 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 uh, in, in terms of having the higher sampling, right? So here's typically what the bounds from dynamic signals look like. I'm not showing you any particular benchmark. So think of this as a cartoon for now to see how, how the different, uh, we, just, we just wanna uh, see how the, how the different uh, slopes look like. So the right-hand side, as I've explained already, it has an issue with sampling. For large enough masses, you do not produce a dynamic signal, you, pro you, you produce a stack static signal. Whereas on the left-hand side, uh, if, because we are restricting ourselves for now with a deterministic one, one uh, signal uh, event, uh, there is, there's a threshold problem. So the, even, uh, even the closest uh, object uh, does not produce a large enough signal for you to see. So you have a left-hand side that, that slopes as, as one over n. And, and I would like to also point out that it's very similar to a direct detection experiment if you want, where the right-hand side, you have a slope. Uh, the direct detection experiment has a, a right-hand side slope because the masses are just too heavy. They do not have a, have a threshold problem. Instead, there's just not enough events hitting your, hitting your de direct detection tank. Whereas on the left-hand side, you do not have a problem with events. It's just that those single events are not producing enough of an electron threshold if you want. And, and, and as a result, there is a left-hand side um, uh, that way, okay. There's also sorry, the earth term. Mm, right. Please. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to, uh, you know, I, I certainly understand, you know, if you see something like a lensing event, what kind of thing you would be looking for, but you were saying something in passing maybe, uh, if, if the event takes longer, you're looking yeah. for a static signal? I don't understand, right. what do you look for if you can't right. see any time dependence? Right. I don't see anything. So can I, you, I, I've not explained that yet. So, so that? This, this is just a dynamic signal. I'm going to come to static signal in two slides. Okay. Oh, you yeah. just haven't talked about it yet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so this is enti entirely just the dynamic signal. And, and that is the reason why the right-hand side exists because I've, I've not shown you yet what you could look for there. So, so I'm just cutting the, cutting the plot off there, although there could be a signal there sitting there. Okay. So in the, in the, the, so this is the pulsar term. In the earth term, you of course have a sampling issue, which means that for, for large enough objects, you will have an earlier cutoff because you have only one earth versus several pulsars. And it turns out the left-hand side work out the same uh, because the closest object is compensated for by the fact that the earth term has better sensitivity. So as a cartoon, this is roughly how the earth term looks. It has the same left-hand side, but the right-hand side happens far earlier. Uh, so let's move to the Shapiro delay. It's very similar to the Sachs-Wolf effect. In frequency domain, you just integrate over the potential and you hope that there's a time-dependent potential caused by the source moving. And for a point-like object, you have a, have a transient signal, of course, because unlike in the Doppler case, if you move an object from plus infinity to minus infinity, it does not somewhere in between where, where you, do not affect the gra uh, you do not affect the source or the Emitter, uh, the emitter or the or the or the receiver themselves, you just affect the light path. You soon you shouldn't see a permanent imprint of this object moving, which means that there were there were photons that there were just bunched up and then they were debunched up as these things left, such that now the the usual communication between the emitter and the absorber is reset, and then you have the exact same thing over new as earlier. Okay. Uh, the, the, the cool part about this now is that this, the, the, the gravitational uh, object, which, which, is, which is misleadingly called a source here, uh, it does not have to be close to either the emitter or the absorber. 
it could instead be anywhere along the light path, right? Which means that the sampling volume is drastically increased. And, and, and it turns out the cross-section looks like a rectangle if you want, with D being the size, the, the distance between the observer and emitter, and B being the impact parameter. So tau, uh, scales as one over np, it's still good to have more pulsars to look at. You have several more rectangles, rectangles to catch these, uh, catch these dark matter objects. Uh, so it turns out that unlike the Doppler signal, where even for small enough tau, you have a permanent imprint, in the case of Shapiro, it's, it's a blip, which means that the increase in amplitude caused by closer and closer objects is exactly compensated for the fact that the closer objects have, have events that last for a shorter time. And, and it turns out that there's an exact cancellation between these. And for small enough tau min, SNR just doesn't depend on tau min. A corollary of this is the fact that SNR has an overall multiplicative factor M. So for small enough M, you cannot compensate for the reduction in, 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 in the threshold by, by increasing F like you could do a couple of slides ago in the case of Doppler. For small enough masses, I can go to F does, that doesn't make sense, albeit, I mean, uh, for, for, for the spirit of, of uh, the discussion, you could take F to 1000 and you would still see a signal. You can't do that in Shapiro. Uh, you're just stuck at this particular M, M for the reason I just explained. Whereas the right-hand side has the same sampling problem. Uh, so you have this one over M behavior for, for large enough masses, right? Um, sorry, can I, so, sorry, can I, I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm following the basics, okay? Because yeah. I'm not, not sure I am. So, so here you're, uh, you're imagining you've got a pulsar here and we're getting the signal from the pulsar and then some clump moves past the path of the, you know, the, the right? Exactly. But, now it's not it's not just the basic just the basic physics somehow is not obvious to me because I would think well this stuff is following it falling into a potential well and falling out. Right. But, but what we see I guess is some phase distortion or what what is it that we what is it that you observe? So you actually see a frequency change as uh, so so uh, one might naively think that if 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 there naively, was a gravitational I would think you fall in you fall out the frequency doesn't change. Right, for a, for a static gravitational object, that is true. Uh -huh. Whereas for a moving- It's independent, I see. Exactly, so what you fall in, fall in and fall out of are not symmetric, so there is a, there is a small change in frequency because you moved in this, in this time-dependent gravitational potential well. But there's not, is there not also, I mean, I would have, I guess what I would have guessed, just totally naive, okay, but what right. I somehow would have guessed is that it's the fact that you know, the time is different. So if you, if I think, imagine an object falling in and then falling out, mm -hmm. and it's, it's timing. It takes a different amount of time to do that. Uh, I would have thought. And then, so if you sort of remove that, there would be some sort of phase distortion or something like that. There's but nothing like it, that. But if, it, I mean, there is indeed a phase distortion, but, yeah. uh, but, uh, but that, but that does lead to a frequency distortion too, right? When you take a derivative. I guess, yeah, I guess it's the same. I guess it's the same thing, right? So right. somehow if you were to decompose what I'm calling a phase distortion in frequency space, you can indeed. see it's the same. I think it's the same effect. That we're indeed, about. indeed. Okay. In fact, whatever I'm talking about can be talked about in phase correlators rather than the frequency correlator picture I'm doing here. And we actually checked that the SNR analysis are pretty similar. They have to be. I mean, that, there's only one thing you can observe here. Indeed, okay, no, I'm just I'm just mimicking the the language that pulsar timing collaborations use here. So so that's the reason why everything is put in frequency right. space. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No worries. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, so yeah. So so uh, that's the Shapiro signal, indeed. Uh, and one thing to point out is, of course, that the Shapiro signal can never have an Earth term like the Doppler signal did, because the, the sampling volumes are never never intersect, right? They only intersect very close to the Earth, and that's very tiny sampling volume. So there is never an Earth term we consider consider for the Shapiro Shapiro signal. So putting these still just the dynamic limits next to each other, you you see that the sampling volume is larger for Shapiro. But then, because it's 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 the effect we talk about, it's it's light interacting with with these with these blobs. Uh, in some sense, that sensitivity is much poorer. It's a much smaller much smaller uh, uh, event, if you want. 
And as a result, you could compare it to say, uh, uh, Super K versus Xenon, where Super K has a much uh, superior sampling volume, but a much inferior threshold. And as a result, it, it works at larger masses. Whereas, whereas in this case, Doppler works at smaller masses. It has superior thresholds, but inferior sampling volumes. Okay. Uh, so let's now move to uh, Marcus's question. What happens to the static signals? In the, in the limit that you don't see the whole signal, you tailor as expand. Suppose someone magically gave you, hey, this is exactly how pulsars spin. This is how much they spin down. This is how much uh, uh, they have their second derivative. Then I would just go measure these pulsars. I would say, hey, that's not what I observe, which means that this, this guy is right, I trust him, which means that there is some other dark matter objects that are causing a static change in these, in these periods, in these period derivatives and so on. Unfortunately, we do not un understand pulsars enough to, do, to make that kind of statement, which means the best we can do is fit away these and hope for one particular, at, uh, at some point, uh, a derivative prediction from dark matter to be larger than what is than than that particular derivative being observed. Okay, so 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 this is what we did. So you you cannot observe a phase. You do not you cannot observe a new. You cannot observe a new dot. These as in all these are much larger than what you would predict. But it so happens that new double dot and above have not been observed for for pulsar timing collaborations yet. Then you can ask, does the non-observation of a second derivative, can it be used to set constraints? So throw away the rest and then ask, can the second derivative be used to set constraints? So, so taking the, that uh, uh, too seriously, these are the kind of limits that you would set. So the Doppler, uh, this is the dotted line. It kind of compensates for the fact that you cut off the dynamic constraint uh, as, soon as, as, as soon as it became dynamic to static. Uh, so the Doppler kind of makes up for it, the Doppler static. And the Shapiro, again, there is, there is a static signal you see here that is to the right. One caveat here, um, the, the, the dynamic signals are a much more robust discovery tool than the static signals ever be. Because uh, the dynamic signals have a very characteristic shape that you can fit for. Uh, and and, and so, so you, could, you could convince yourself that this is a dark matter event. Whereas a static signal could be anything. It could just be that you are starting to finally, uh, with, with higher sensitivity, you're finally starting to discover the intrinsic second derivative of the pulsar. It could be as simple as that. Or it could be, uh, um, it could be baryonic objects uh, for, uh, somewhere. You would see that static signals are especially uh, uh, vulnerable to baryonic background, as I will discuss. And it could be because of baryonic background. And in that case, you will have to train your telescope within that that kiloparsec at 10 kiloparsec to see if it was actually a star or if you didn't see anything at all, which means that it's a dark matter clump doing, doing that thing. So for those reasons, I plotted in the dot, dotted line and, I, and, I, uh, and, I, uh, and full disclosure, a dynamic signal is way more robust in terms of both limit setting. In limit setting, they're both the same, but in terms of discovery, it's way more robust to, to, consider, to consider dynamic signals. Okay. Can I, can so I now, can yeah, I, please, please. So, so in order for this to make sense, you have to, uh, you have to sort of, uh, I mean, it, it, in fact, well, so it, 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 you need to have that there are no other clumps of stuff doing this. So Indeed. things like just gas, I don't know, interstellar gas, just stuff like that. Indeed. So is there, is there a kind of a quick way to see why these dark matter effects would be bigger than that? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that in, in, a, in a few slides. Yeah, a few slides, yeah. So, so uh, let me just present you the last type of signal and then, and then I'll deal with backgrounds for all of them. So in, the, in our first paper, we only considered deterministic signal, which means that we only looked at single individual objects. What we left on the table was multiple events at lower masses, which do not pass the SNR threshold individually. Albeit they could, they could be together, the, you could look for a stochastic signal of, of, of all these events. And, and uh, the problem, of course, is that you would be able to fit for a deterministic signal shape, right? So what happens to the left of these is, is the question we answered in our next paper. Our point, of course, was that instead of looking, fitting for events, instead, let's look at delta phi, delta phi correlators, right? Just correlator in, in, in the face, if you want. 
And, and, and what would that look like? You could divide that, of course, into, into correlations, self-correlations and cross-correlations between different halos. If the halos were uncorrelated, then the second term will just vanish because there shouldn't be a non-trivial correlation between uncorrelated events. Whereas if for some reason the halo subhalos arranged themselves in some, some freaky pattern in, in the galaxy, then you will have a non-trivial contribution from the two halo term as well. So, uh, so we do not consider the two halo term because we do not know of a reason why they should arrange this way. Uh, so we consider only the one halo term and then SNR is, is, is described this way. Uh, so, so, so using these, these uh, autocorrelators. So the point of course is that in the deterministic signal, you cared about the single closest event, which means there was a concept of a random best pulsar. Right. However, for the stochastic signal, the pulsar term, of course, has an NP, NP pulsars contributing to more statistics. However, the earth term, as we pointed out before, can cross correlate us across pulsars with angular correlations. And the earth term always wins in a stochastic signal because of this analogy. For the highest single die roll, it helps to keep rolling your die. If you had a hundred sided die, you would, uh, you would ask for rolling it, uh, you know, uh, close to a hundred times in order to get the number hundred. Right. Whereas if, if what I'm instead rewarding you for is the sum of 100 die rolls, it doesn't make too much sense for you to do the 100 roll uh, experiment over and over again. You would on an average get the same number. Your, 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 uh, your variance in the average would be a much smaller number if you want. That's, that's another, way to, another way to see this. So then what happens is taking the earth term into account for the stochastic signal. So here's your Doppler deterministic pulsar in green. Uh, Doppler de de deterministic uh, earth in bright green, you see a kick out in smaller masses. In even smaller masses, you're sensitive to the stochastic signal. Okay, so this is, uh, and, and of course, the stochastic signal you're, you're, you're helped with because while each, each event is, is a jump in velocity, uh, a bunch of events is, is a random walk. So, so they could be in any given direction, these, these jumps in velocities, but these, all these jumps add together to give you a non-trivial change in velocity over the period of, period of time that, that you observe. And that's what the stochastic constraint in some sense coming from. The Shapiro signal in some sense is much smaller. Uh, you are instead now asking, oh, there are all these blips that I'm seeing. What is the likelihood that the sum of all these blips is smaller than the intrinsic white noise that, that I observe? So the, the, the constraints are much poorer, albeit they, they still exist because the deterministic con constraint was just cut off at some small, at some small mass. So, so it kicks out outside it. Sorry, so now having, having laid out all, oh yeah, please. Sorry, sorry, I'm, again, I'm sorry, just trying to, so, so, so I, I, I don't think I've really understood um, this stochastic signal. The idea somehow, usually when I think of something being stochastic, I think about, well, there's, you know, a bunch of measurements that by themselves are not significant, but there's some correlation, right, that makes them significant. So, yep. so you're looking for a something that's like a static signal and using the number of measurements and correlations between them or what, sorry, I just didn't understand. What yeah, is yeah. So it's easiest understood, here? it's easiest understood with a Doppler, okay? So, so in, in the case D nu over nu, if there was no dark matter at all, uh, naively I would just expect, expect a flat line. A line in, sorry, flat line in what? Sorry, did you broke up. D new over new. What is, I want to ask, what is the velocity of a pulsar? Right. Uh, because, uh, because, I mean, what is the velocity of the pulsar from studying the frequency derivative? That's the question I want to ask. Mm -hmm. Or the change in the velocity, because the velocity itself is, of course, uh, uh, so, so D new over new is, is synonymous with V over C plus intrinsic D new over new. D new or new that I observe is synonymous with the velocity plus some intrinsic frequency derivative. Yeah. Okay. And now, uh, so, so this is hinges on the fact that nothing funny is going on with this pulsar. Of course, the pulsar was doing crazy things by itself. This analysis will just not make sense. We got lucky these pulsars for reasons we do not fully understand respect this law that, that D new over new is approximately constant, right? Now, the claim, of course, is that we are very good at measuring if the pulsars have constant velocity or not for this reason. So any, so in the previous part of the talk, we argued that, that small 
changes in velocity, like an instantaneous jump will be measurable if it's larger than the intrinsic noise associated with, with all the statements I made, right? And I further said that that's something I can even fit to because there would be a grad, not a gradual, but, but, a, but, a, uh, but a particular shape, as a, 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 a signature shape by which this increase or decrease in velocity will happen, right? But now I argue that, okay, uh, each single event, its rise is much smaller than, than, than what I'm sensitive to. So I cannot do a single event analysis, right? But instead, I can look up at a bunch of objects which are all impinging, which are all causing velo small velocity jumps, right? But what does this accumulation give? Naively, we would think that there will be velocity pulls and pushes in opposite directions, which means that the sum has to be zero. However, that's not how random walks work. If you keep tossing a coin up uh, with heads and tails, the sum of it would be, would be increasing with square root of n, right? So you just take the final velocity after 20 years, subtract it from the initial velocity, rather than the most aggressive n times small velocity jumps, it won't be that, neither will it be zero, but instead it will be square root of n times the number of velocity jumps. Okay. Yeah, I think what, what, I, what I was missing was just that what you're looking for, your, your signal is now many, many small events. Indeed. Many small, like for example, in this case, lending events. Indeed. Right? Indeed. Right? indeed, indeed, indeed. Right, okay, I got it, thank you. Yep. No worries, uh, thank you. So yeah, so now let me move to the background just so that I can, I can make some uh, robust uh, constraints for you. So the, so, the, so the dirty way to understand why something like this works is putting these all together. So notice that each, an, each individual, uh, each individual uh, probe of dark matter is sensitive to at max uh, three to four orders of magnitude and mass. Okay. Dob Scotch is sensitive to 10 to the minus 19, 13 to 10 to the minus 8. Dob Dead Earth is sensitive to 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 9, and, and so on. Similarly, uh, Shab Debt is sensitive to you know, 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the 0, and so on. Right? And the point, of course, is that uh, if you want your particular constraint to be mired by, by uh, baryonic background, then baryonic background better compete with dark matter in number density in that particular, uh, in that particular range. Notice that when I consider monochromatic objects, I'm putting all of dark matter density to, con to, to exist in that narrow mass window, or in this case, exactly at the same mass. So the number density is through the roof in the, in the small mass window if I'm considering objects of that mass. Whereas the baryonic background is nice and, and, and split in, in, terms of, in terms of where they are. So main sequence stars make up, if I'm not wrong, 1% of all of, dark, all of uh, matter. So, so um, um, all of baryons, I think, makes up 4%. So 25% so, so so of that is in, is in stars. And if you go to smaller and smaller objects, there are smaller and smaller mass densities in them. It's just how it is. Planets do not make up comparable to how, uh, comparable mass density to how many uh, to the mass density made up of in stars. There are things called brown dwarfs, which of course make uh, so it's around ten to the minus six solar masses. Here it's called substellar objects. Again, these are all sub percent. Furthermore, they are, you can always like look at mass windows which are outside. So so smaller and smaller. So so. Um, probes which are sensitive to smaller and smaller masses will not be sensitive to, 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 uh, so to these backgrounds. So, so here are, are in, in red are the masses that are, that are uh, important for static backgrounds. So it is true that the static background will be mired with the stuff. And, and it, it remains to be seen if you can compensate with a telescope, uh, uh, with an optic, um, uh, uh, supplement with an optic thing to see if, 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 if these were indeed stars or if it was some dark, dark object we do not understand yet. And whereas in the dynamic constraint, the, the, the baryonic component is just too darn small to, to, to make up any kind, of, uh, any kind of signal. Furthermore, you could worry about things like molecular gas. They are just very, very diffuse objects, right? So that is one more reason why, why these might not contribute to, to, uh, uh, to the signals we are looking at. Um, so, so this is this is the reason why baryonic objects might not be that big a deal. One more reason, of course, is that most of the baryonic objects are either co-rotating with a pulsar or co-rotating with the Earth, whereas dark matter is just purely virialized. 
So it's just moving about in a very different way to how these objects are moving about. So if you had something, say, um, orbiting around the pulsar, that will not contribute to the signal because it's, you, can, you can do a Fourier transform. Its frequency would be very different from an object that's free, that's just transiting across, across the pulsar. Okay. There are some other sources of background that are intrinsic to the pulsar. There are things called glitches. These are sudden increases in frequency followed by slow relaxation. Uh, these are, of course, reduced significantly for the Earth term uh, because you can... <clears throat> these glitches are not in every pulsar at all the time. They, are, they, they happen, say, once every 10 years or so uh, that, that a pulsar might glitch. This is not fully understood. Also, their shapes are very different from, from the kind of shapes that we're interested in. We also consider a simplistic white noise here. In reality, there are things like dispersion through the interstellar medium. Uh, these are frequency dependent on red. Um, some pulsars also suffer from intrinsic red noise. So these are things we have not taken into account completely in our, in our current uh, projects. So the next step that we are, we are hoping to do is combine with, with uh, uh, the nanograph collaboration, people in there to check signal survival when you take all these effects into account properly. Um, so across the board, dynamic signals are more spectacular than static signals. Uh, the shape difference could help differentiate from glitches. Dark matter signals are non-dispersive. So you could do exactly what a lensing survey does, which I show on the right. So what they do is they do lensing in blue and red and ask the question, hey, does the ratio actually vanish, which it should for, for a purely gravitational event, whereas something that has a refractive index which will look very different in blue and red. So this is something that pulsar timing collaboration can do too. So this frequency is different. It's the carrier wave frequency, which is, uh, which is in some sense the, the radio wave that's coming. You do it at half the frequency at a different radio wave signal, take the ratio to see if this signal survives. Uh, <clears throat> and as I pointed out, baryonic structure is too few at, at smaller masses where, where I consider everything to be super robust. Uh, bad news, a few pulsars for the static background already display non-zero second derivative. Uh, so you will need to supplement this with ENM observation to subtract known nearby objects. Okay. So how am I doing on time? Do you have like 15 minutes? I think you have, uh, officially you have my minute, my minute left, but you, you, you can, okay. five, let's say five minutes. Yeah. 10 minutes, okay, cool. Uh, sorry, about, sorry, sorry about going so slowly. Uh, yeah, so I have about I 10 slides left. A lot of questions. I'm sorry. No, no worries. So, so I have 10 slides, so, so I, would, I would love to finish it. So let me, let me try my best. Uh, so, so this is an MC distribution. Let me skip this. I, I, just, I just tell you that, that we do an MC analysis to make sure uh, we don't uh, get mired by, you know, look, look elsewhere effect and things like that. We, we, we simulate universes and make sure 95% pass the cut all that. And, and we also need to do subtractions. We need to remove the fine odd, fine odd uh, uh, frequency and fine odd frequency mu dot. So it's only the solid curves here that are relevant. Those are the only things that can set limits. Okay? So with SKA, you see that the blue, the dot stochastic signal is sensitive to a small region in parameter space if almost 100% of dark matter is in it. Uh, the deterministic uh, signal is not sensitive at all. It's just about scratching the surface of, of F equals one. And, and, and the pink, uh, no hope, and uh, the deterministic, uh, you, could do, you could do pretty well. You could go all the way to F, uh, F equals 10 to the minus two, because I had pointed out that, that sampling, is, sampling is very, very uh, you have large sampling for, 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 uh, the, for the Shapiro signal, right? The optimistic, of course, is more optimistic. That's probably what they should gun for if they're really looking for, for uh, a dark matter with pulsar timing arrays. But this is well within, within technological uh, reach. It's, it remains to be seen how much money could be spent on sampling so many pulsars. That, in some sense, is the only bottleneck. And with that, all these probes for PBHs are sensitive to, to non-trivial Fs, but you see that lensing kind of uh, uh, removes, the, removes the thunder of this, of this measurement, if you want. Like most of the parameter space, uh, lensing does much better than, and lensing is today, which means that lensing will also have improvements in the future. So you might think, I wasted your time for the last one hour, I'm gonna take 10 more minutes and waste your time. Is this a silver medal, right? Are limits comparable, uh, but subdominant in all of lensing parameter space? The answer is that that's probably not the reason why you should be doing PDAs. You should be doing it for diffuse objects. 
We have seen point like objects till now. If the size of the object is smaller than the impact parameter, Gauss's law tr says treat the object as point like. And there's signal loss is if object size is greater than the impact parameter. And you can get conservative estimate just from MN close, right? So with this, so, so let me just parameterize the objects I have, extended objects as some NFW halo. Uh, and to, to cut to the chase, I have this parameter C, which is, the, which is a concentration parameter, core radius over what's called the virial radius. And the one thing to remember for the all future plots is that larger C correspond to more compact objects. Thus, the C equals infinity limit is PBH, whereas CDM is C equals 10 to C equals 100 is where CDM sits. So, so those are two important numbers to remember. So microlensing, uh, uh, I'll skip this slide too. Uh, the point to remember is that Einstein, there is something called the Einstein radius. If the object is much smaller than the Einstein radius, you're okay, which is true for like PBHs. It's not true for more diffuse objects. So you can ask, uh, let me draw, let me see what, what the impact parameter is or the Einstein radius is as a function of a particular mass, right? And lensing, it's looking at a few billion stars for a few, few hours, but pulsar timing arrays is only looking for at max a thousand pulsars over a few years. And the corollary of, of, of them being competitive in albeit PDA 30 years from now, is the fact that one has to have much smaller impact parameter, one has to have much larger impact parameter. Lensing is winning because it's doing way more sampling than PTAs ever could do, right? So, so the corollary of this enormous impact parameter is the fact that fatter and fatter objects can be considered as point-like, right? And, and, and th this is where pulsar timing wins, really. So here I plot R, uh, the, the size, as I go to a smaller and smaller concentric circle, how much mass do I lose? That is what I plot here. So you see that for PBHs, you do not lose any mass. Uh, you stay at 10 to the minus eight solar masses. So, so this is a 10 to the minus eight solar mass object to begin with. I keep dialing the concentration parameter, which I want. So, so for, for C equals infinity, you have no mass loss, but for like say C equals 10 to the four, which is, which is the dot dash line here, the topmost dot dash line, you see that there is tremendous mass loss. So, so smaller and smaller concentric object has lesser and lesser mass, okay? So uh, the, 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 the point here is that this is almost a theorem that a red curve will be, uh, will be probed by a particular uh, um, probe only if it intersects that colored line. So, if, if, so let's take 10 to the four and 10 to the minus eight solar masses. C equals infinity uh, goes, passes through each one of these, which means that PBH will be sensitive to, uh, all these will be sensitive to PBHs. That's roughly true for C equals 10 to the eight. Uh, 10 to the 14, but with 10 to the 8, you see that already uh, you, you have weaker constraints. And for C equals 10 to the 4, there is no intersection with either the supernova or the stellar lines, which means that you will have no sensitivity. Whereas with the Doppler blue and the yellow lines, you do have these intersections, which means that there, there is going to be some sensitivity to it. Okay. So let me show it to you concretely in terms of uh, how these limits look. So Lensing did, uh, you know, do much better than 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 all these all these uh, PTA probes. Let's see how it handles concentration parameters of ten to the four. I've not shown the gray because it doesn't exist. It's just uh, even with C equals ten to the four, there are just no limits anymore. It's just much smaller than we need to go to much larger f's to possibly start constraint. And 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 whereas. PTAs relatively remain untouched because those are the kind of impact parameters we are working with. In fact, you can go to C equals 100 or even C equals 10, and you still have some residual, uh, uh, residual um, uh, reach for, for, for these Cs. Shapiro does worse because as we showed, uh, Shapiro is much uh, inferior in terms of the threshold it can probe, which means that the objects have to be closer. It won only because it had a much larger sampling, so it loses out. You see, uh, Shapiro cannot do better than C equals 10 to the 4. Uh, whereas Doppler can do C equals 100 or C equals 10. Uh, uh, let me remind you, C is the ratio of the, of, of the virial radius to core radius. It determines how diffuse your objects are. So this is what the SKA curves look like. Uh, you can do, of course, do C equals 10 to the 4, but you really need to go to optimistic constraints to start being able to probe uh, objects. So I'm, I'm, I'm rushing here, I'm, I'm really sorry, but, but uh, the, more, the more realistic objects that can exist in our, in our uh, galaxy are thought to be just the cores of these halos. The cores are much more dense objects. It's possible that the, that the 
if you want to call it the mantle and the crust gets stripped away by by the by the galactic um, uh, gravitational fields whereas the core remain so these are the kind of uh, limits you can set um, and rho s here in some sense is the average density it's just a different way of plotting the concentration parameter so the error bands here correspond to f equals one and 30 percent of dark matter existing in all these cores and and now for the first time i'm showing you where lambda cdm would sit in in, in, a, in a parameter space like this uh, where lambda cdm is just taken for for density density purposes of course lambda cdm will also have a very different halo mass function here i'm plotting only monochromatic halo mass objects so so but but it's, it's it seems like a very uh, um, it, it, these optimistic constraints are, are 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 very very nice in that they can probe even the most diffuse objects out there. To, just just for reference, I'm prodding here rho dm, which is the cosmic density inside the galaxy. So what it's saying is that it's of course a it's dumb to show parameter regions below rho dm because then a halo doesn't exist for densities like that. But but it's nice to see that you can probe the entire parameter space with with Doppler constraints even to the most diffuse halos are are, are probable if if you can if you can go to these optimistic list of parameters. So in the, in, in 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 the last two minutes. I would like to show you what's called the extended halo mass function. So people use something called the press sector formalism to understand if there was an initial uh, scale-free primordial power spectrum, what do the halo mass functions look like? And the result is that d and dm, number of number of number density of objects in a particular mass goes like m to the minus two. There are, you could introduce some abrupt cutoff m min and m max that are determined like things like washout, things like you know uh, uh, the scale free property is true for a power spectrum only in a limited length range, and that will lead to like cutoffs in m min and m max based on your theory. Uh, but 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 the fascinating point about this DN, dm being m to the minus two is that there are equal amount of dark matter in every decade of masses, which means that even large m max and m min in your theory can be probed using sensitivity solely to a small subset mass window. Let's say m max is 10 to the 12, m, which is the galactic mass, m min is 10 to the minus 12. These are 24 orders of magnitude and masses. You would think, hey, this guy is sensitive only to two orders of magnitude and mass. How is he possibly be, going to be sensitive to this extended halo mass distribution? We are sensitive because there are equal amount of masses and equal uh, decades. So if you're sensitive to four decades in mass, then you're, as long as you're sensitive to dark matter densities of four over 24, which is say around, you know, uh, what is it like 20%, if you're sensitive to 20% in that four orders of magnitude mass, you'll be sensitive to this extended halo mass function that's, that's distributed over these 24 orders of magnitude. That in some sense is the point. That's the, uh, the, the powerfulness of, 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 of uh, press sector uh, type uh, halo mass functions. Last slide, I'll set limits for uh, C, the concentration parameter, F, the fraction of dark matter that has not been disrupted. I will ignore tidal stripping, and I'll justify it by saying that that in some sense sculpts C. So, so if you believed in an initial concentration parameter, the Cs are probably larger now because only the cores remain. And I'll also sweep it in F. If you believed F was 100% earlier, maybe F is 10% now because 90% of the halos got disrupted. But regardless, you can, you can map any th theory you have with a careful calculation of tidal disruption to the model, to the, to the parameter space I'm going to show you now. So, so just some prediction for, for what CDM looks like. CDM predicts larger and larger concentration parameters for smaller masses. People haven't done analysis on less than 10 to the minus six because there is some, there is some bias in terms of WIMPs. People have thought about only WIMPs, uh, whereas who knows what the, what the cross sections are with standard models. So, so C could be, uh, so masses could be much smaller. So I'm gonna take C equals 10, 10 to C equals 100 to be the benchmark I'm going after. So these are the kind of extended halo mass functions you can look like, look you can look at. So uh, I'm showing here m min, the minimum cutoff in your halo mass function in the left plot. I'm going to assume that m max equals 10 to the 12. So so your halo masses go anywhere between m min and 10 to the 12 m max, and the halo mass function looks like m to the minus two, as predicted by press sector. Okay, and and these are the kind of constraints you can set. So so. Uh, some of these probes, we, it can point to you where exactly your halo mass function stops 
and in, in, in the very naive CDM that tells you where uh, uh, kinetic decoupling happened, the temperature at which uh, kinetic de decoupling between dark matter and standard model happened. Did it happen before? Uh, which, uh, did it happen before, which would which would mean that that uh, dark matter has has fewer interactions than WIMP, uh, smaller interactions than WIMP, or did it happen much after, which means that they will have stronger interactions than WIMP? Things like that can be answered with the left plot. The right plot. This is associated with with ob with with dark matter models, which have which have peaks in, in, your, in your halo mass function, which means that they populate only a small range in dark matter halo masses. So say M max is 10 to the three M and only three orders of magnitude and mass is populated. And, and I show constraints for, for what different concentration parameters will look like for, for, for uh, that parameter space on the right. So let me just uh, finish with an outlook and a conclusion. Uh, MSPs across the galactic center, is that possible to detect? Then you could probe all of the galactic center, except there will be noise and people are already looking at it, looking at multi millisecond pulsars uh, in the X-ray window instead of the radio window and, and possibly seeing if this can be arranged for. Uh, could there could could there be millisecond pulsars in dark matter rich environments, which means that the con which means that um, the local dark matter density is much higher than 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 what I was I was looking at. This could be arranged for say you look at it in in a satellite galaxy. These they have densities much larger. If you look for um, MSPs outside the galaxy in extra galactic MSPs, you could either look for it in dark matter rich environments or you drastically increase the 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 baseline. Whereas I've assumed 10 kiloparsec you could go to much larger distances and the Shapiro will, will enjoy a much larger sampling. Um, next question you can ask is, I've looked at purely gravitational interactions. Could there be fifth forces which are non-gravitational, which pad up this, this signal, much larger signals, uh, because these clumps in some sense have a coherent scattering with, with the Earth or pulsar due to a fifth force that we have, we have not observed yet. My, my wish list in some sense is a better understanding of sub, sub halos today, given an initial power spectrum, than being able to convert limits on sub halos today into limits on a primordial power spectrum. That would be a nice mapping. And then, and then uh, people who, who, who predict a primordial power spectrum could then understand if that's ruled out or not. Um, and of course, understanding better the map between substructure or the lack thereof today and particle physics models. That's, that's the ultimate goal. Uh, to conclude, pulsar timing arrays can probe structure at a wide range of small scales. Uh, Doppler and Shapiro delays, especially in the dynamic regime, can provide a compelling discovery signal for DM uh, subhalos. Uh, and probing CDM subhalos could be even viable as long as you're willing to build this optimistic uh, uh, list of parameters. You could very well go to uh, go and find these uh, CDM halos as long as they populate the lower masses. You, you could go all the way down to 10 to the minus 13 solar masses uh, and, and even get the cutoff in, in your, in your uh, halo mass function. Thank you. Great. Thank you for a nice talk. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for uh, uh, going over. It's okay, I think. It's fine. We have a lot of discussion, yeah. So I have a very basic question. Yeah, please. Uh, I think it's related to your last point. You're saying this connect with the particle physics model. Uh-huh. Um, what, what, what is Axion dark matter? So which parameter space you're probing? Good. So let's go. So let me first mention that there are caveats to what I'm going to show you. There are already people claiming that the fair band analysis might not be the be all and end all of where these halo masses lie. So there might be minor changes to uh, this halo mass function. Okay. So uh, where is it? Here it is. Yeah. So, so their claim is that let's say you had a 10 to the minus four EV axion, right? It, 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 it populates uh, uh, masses from say 10 to the minus nine solar masses and below. Okay. Right? Uh, 10 to the minus seven solar mass uh, objects, which is that close to where uh, ADM X is looking, that would correspond to 10 to the minus five solar masses and below. So this doesn't go all the way, just like the yellow and green, uh, it, 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 it populates around say 10 orders of magnitude and mass. Okay. Your principle, in principle, you can rule it out or discover it, right? Indeed, indeed. 
So what's the DP constant? This is the QCD axiom, right? No? This is, this is the QCD axiom, correct. Okay, I understand. Thank yeah. you. It's a QCD axiom. Do we have mm -hmm. other questions? I, I have I have some questions, but I guess I wanted to give somebody else a chance since I <laughs> interrupted so much. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I just I, 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 um, just some naive questions. Is there is there uh, you know the 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 frequency is super stable in these pulsars? Uh, what about the amplitude? Mm. Is there any? I mean, a stable, is there any information in the amplitude that you could use? So, uh, the, <coughs> so uh, I, have, I have not thought about the amplitude at all. And, but how do you envision the amplitude changing? You're saying as the object moves yeah, I just mean, away, there'll be thing. a I mean, if, Suppose if the amplitude was super stable over these time scales, you could mm -hmm. think about effects that affect the amplitude, right? I, I don't know. I'm just curious if anybody's thought about that. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think anybody has thought about that. In fact, yeah, doesn't I, the I amplitude depend on how much stuff is falling in? So, uh, fall. What is stuff now? Well, I mean, there's some. It's there's a jet coming out of the pole of the pulsar, right? Indeed, indeed. And there's some. That's not just the pulsar just doesn't emit things by itself. It needs some accretion disk or something, I thought. Indeed. Uh, well, it's just not. Oh, no, but the accretion disk already happened. I do not know. I don't think the pulsars have active accretion disks today. They have already been spun up. Yeah, otherwise, you wouldn't expect the frequency to be stable either. I mean, you're not. Exactly. This is this is not something that's being perturbed. I thought that's the point. It got started somehow, and now it's just it just it's just inertially it's just going through inertia. It's just somehow. Indeed. Uh, I I do not I, I yeah I, I do not know the answer to your question, Mark. It's very interesting. Uh, I do not know of 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 an answer to this. Uh, so I guess you're you're envisioning just like how the frequency changes, the amplitude would change because the distance to the source keeps changing. For example, I mean, and just all these effects that you said, it seems like at some level they would affect the amplitude. So if you if the amplitude was super stable and also something you could measure, you have to be able to measure it accurately. I was yeah. suspecting that you might tell me that the amplitude is a lot harder to measure, right? Because you know somehow a frequency. Uh, you know, you're comparing something to a to a very accurate clock that yep. you have on Earth. That's somehow maybe easier to measure. Whereas the amplitude is your signal strength, and you've got to sort of remeasure it every time. Maybe you maybe it's just not as accurately known. Yeah. Yes. Usually, FM works much better than AM, right? Exactly. And exactly. I think also atmosphere may just change the amplitude, right? Yep, that's but uh, I have probably more background, much bigger background. Agreed, but here's Noise. the thing though. So, so I, I had not mentioned these things. So, uh, the, the when a detection is when, when they report data, what they do is they take data for a few hours every week and then they average over that few hours. Only then is this object stable. It's even the frequency is not very stable in inside that one hour if you want you could you could imagine using these sort of stochastic type tricks to try and do better right i mean yep. even if if you're measuring something many times if you're really measuring random fluctuations you do very well but yep. if there's some you know more systematic effect on top of that maybe if it's the right time scale maybe you can see it right yeah yeah i, I agree i yeah i've not thought about this at all yeah uh i should yeah Another, another question is, um, maybe you said it and I sort of missed it, but I don't have a sense of, so uh, what kind of delta rho over rho uh, mm. are you sensitive to? So in other words, are you only sensitive if you have some extreme over density? Like obviously a primordial black hole is an extreme <laughs> over density, right? I mean, right. It's delta rho over rho like infinity almost or something, right? But, so, but 
Are you, in, are you at all sensitive here to delta rho over rho sort of order one? Are you ever, is there any model where you could imagine being sensitive to clumps of delta rho or not, not one, but a few or not a huge number? Yep. So let's go to uh, this plot, okay? So the, here, I, let me address this question for monochromatic objects. Okay. okay. Monochromatic and objects, you mean like, uh, like, like black, like little black holes that all have exactly the same mass? Is that what you mean? All, no. Yeah. All of dark matter is in masses, say, ten to the minus seven solar masses. Okay. In like clumps, it's like in in like, clumps. Yeah. Okay. Now I want to ask the question: How much denser, or how much how much denser is each individual clump? compared to the, you know, the 0 0.3 GV per centimeter cube right, I'm used exactly. to. Exactly. But right? it's a huge number, I think, in those Right. Ways. So rho dm is that dashed line. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. Lambda CDM is what lambda CDM would predict for how much denser than rho CDM uh, halos will be. That's the solid line, solid okay. black line. All right. Okay. And 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 the, the and this is how well uh, these constraints do. They go all the way to rho CDM. Huh. Yeah. It's it's it, it's pretty it's pretty uh, insane. And and it comes from the fact that um, the radius within which these clumps have to be contained becomes smaller and smaller. Of course, as I keep going to say, ten to the minus fourteen solar masses. But but. Uh... Should I take away because this you went this plot just went by way too fast, so I didn't yeah. understand it to be honest. So 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 is this plot saying that you're 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 saying that PTA should see a signal in lambda CDM or what what else is going into this? Yes. So so yeah. So I I did go uh, very fast towards the end. I apologize. So so if you want to ask a CDM specific question. This is probably not the plot to look at because CDM also predicts that halo masses are not monochromatic, right? But let's pretend that somehow you arrange for monochromatic objects. I don't know how. You can ask the question, what kind of over densities you'll be sensitive to? That will be answered by this plot. Yeah, and of course, the region below rho dm doesn't make sense because there this analysis is even wrong. You, it explicitly assumes that there are over densities below rho CD, rho right. dm. There are just no such objects that exist. So, so pardon right. me for that, but I just wanted to, you know, yeah, show I how. And you have some. You have to do simplified. So, so, but then to answer your question, we go to left of this slide. Okay. So CDM predicts that M max is 10 to the 12. That's just a, you know, a consistency condition that the largest mass is the galaxy mass itself. Okay. And M min is what I'm plotting in the x-axis. So here the halo mass function for whatever reason has a hard cutoff at, at some M min. Okay. So for pure vanilla CDM, uh, it, it's a complicated question what this M min is, but let's pretend that we, there is some weak interactions between dark matter and standard model, uh, which, which sets a kinetic decoupling scale. Mm -hmm. For three MAV, uh, that kinetic decoupling corresponds to, uh, corresponds to cutoff of around 10 to the minus six solar masses, right? For weaker couplings, this M min will get push to the left more and more. So you're saying that if, so this is somehow if dark matter is light enough, if dark matter is cold, but if it's sufficiently light, right. there should be a signal. That's what you're saying. Indeed. Sufficiently light? Why do you say light? Well, you just used an example of a few MeV dark matter. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was talking about temperatures at which decoupling is happening. Oh, oh so this is just literally like a hundred GV wimp or whatever. Indeed, indeed, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, okay. So I know two caveats to uh, objects not existing at smaller masses. One is this kinetic decoupling issue. If, if, if there is just some, some interactions which keep these in kinetic decoupling until much later, then structure gets washed out. Another one is if dark matter is quote unquote fuzzy. 
So 10 to the minus six solar, so 10 to the minus say 11 solar mass objects are really small objects. Yeah. And if, you're, if your Compton wavelength is larger than this object, they will just start diffusing out of this object. So this object cannot exist. Well, that was actually my, my next and my last question, sorry. Is, uh, okay. Is, uh, is, is, is it understood if you have, um, you know, coherent bosonic uh, field dark matter, mm -hmm. I, I might think that there could be some kind of uh, uh, structure, you know, kind of delta rho over rho order one-ish associated with the Compton wavelength. So in other words, once things start virializing, you know, the Compton wavelength is setting the basic length scale over which things either constructively or destructively interfere. So Indeed. I might think that there's some kind of, you know, stochastic, but it structure that somehow is, I might wonder, I'm asking, is set by the de Broglie wavelength for this kind of dark matter. And I'm just so, wondering if people looked at that, if you tried to figure out what this halo mass function would look like, what the... So there are a few things people have looked at. I mean, uh, this might, all of them might not entirely uh, directly answer your question. So the, so the first thing people have looked at is of course what I showed, which is after a PQ phase transition, what kind of objects form, right? Right. So this is still pretty early on though in, in, in the universe. Yeah, this is, I'm just asking just right. late time evolution, just the okay. fact that dark matter falls and virializes, even though that's what it's doing in galaxy halos. I guess most of this stuff is just coming from intergalactic dark matter, right? Oh, what do you mean by that? What is most of this stuff? Your signal, most of your signal, most of your your stuff, your or is it actually coming from dark and matter? And It's all it's all intragalactic. Yeah, the the, the galaxy is is what a few. In yeah, this is ten kiloparsec. Inside, inside the galaxy, it's inside the galaxy halo. Yep, it's inside the okay. galaxy halo. Yeah, so I'm just talking about late time evolution. You know, just right. the fact that things get virialized, not some early production of 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 structure. It's, it's not being looked at. The only things I know, which is which I thought was a cool effect, which I, I was hoping I could do myself, was if you had an object that was larger than, than the wavelength of, of uh, corresponding to the fuzzy mass, right? And then the presence of the galaxy strips the outer layer such that the object now is smaller than it can, it can keep all the scalars, then rather than leaving the core, it will just entirely destroy this object, although it only peeled away a few layers of, 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 of this halo. So rather than, expe rather than expe expecting a core, now you've just like, totally destroyed this object because the smaller object just couldn't keep all the mass. That has been worked out, yes. But but not the detailed dynamics that the question you're asking for that has that has not been worked out. People have on on the other hand worked on these like solitons and 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 uh, 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 axion stars and and things like that. That side of things have, has been worked on like really compact objects. Right, 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 right. right. But but just, not and, this. And just just to, the the stupidest question. Well, these these pulsars are in our galaxy. Yes, they're indeed. in our galaxy. Indeed. Okay, indeed. so that's I, I shouldn't have even asked about intergalactic dark matter. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. It, it will be very hard. So I mean, this is again a hope that they are starting to possibly think of millisecond pulsars outside our galaxy, but we have we do not know of of one yet. Okay. Cool. This is very cool stuff. Thank yeah. you. So let's thank Hari again. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Don't go yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're not off the hook yet. Are you hungry? <laughs> no.